ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ ಫಾರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಝೀರೋ ಹಿಯರ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ವೇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಎನಿಬಡಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡಿವೆಲಪ್ ದಮ್ ಸೆಲ್ಸ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದ ರೈಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ರೈಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ my teacher used to say that helping oneself he said there's an old saying god helps those who help themselves have you ever heard that yes and then he said helping oneself means putting yourself in front of transcendental sound vibration so even if you're not in the mood if somehow rather you crawl and you get there and put yourself down in front of the vibration then there you'll feel some transformation in a good way. So it's it's a real pleasure to be back here. Uh also one can't underestimate or one one shouldn't uh, underestimate the the power of of one little place like this where you come together with high ideas and a high s- a, s- a sound vibration. Uh great things start in small places. I mean even in the corporate world you find that uh Hewlett and Packard started in a little garage somewhere tinkering around Steve Wozniak Steve Jobs garage good ideas and they just they just kept at it and it expanded in in amazing ways the same thing in your small home you make a space somewhere if you have the right ideas and you churn them and uh, they'll they'll grow in your life it's the amazing thing about being a human there's no limit to how much you can grow especially spiritually tonight i was given the task of talking about uh, mind hacks that is ways in which to get the most out of one's mind and i have a few ideas i'd like to share with you tonight But before I do, I just like to hear from you what brought you here, just from a few people. What what was the main impetus for you to come here tonight? Go ahead. Sharing means caring. Connection. Heard that from the Salvation Army. Yes. What? Connection and love. Connection, Connection and love. Connection and love. Wow, that's powerful. That's uh kind of the definition of yoga. especially bhakti yoga which is about connection the word yoga comes from the root word yuj in sanskrit which means to connect and it's for lack of connection actually say the wisdom literatures that i feel out of alignment and i'm not able to reach my full potential so connection is very pop- powerful especially if you connect in the right place and love according to the the great texts on yoga love is the highest emotion it fully informs us keeps us connected at the same time in love there's elements that are invaluable like gratitude it's naturally there in love and it's a uh, also helps us to reach our highest potential which is one of the goals of bhakti yoga thank you what else why did why did you come here what did you see something what what were the what was the main thought in your mind that brought you here yes to raise your consciousness and you what what gave you the idea that you would be able to raise your consciousness by coming here tonight when you hear different speeches from somebody uh, that they have good consciousness saying you and other people that is speaking this mantra house okay it makes us more uh, more visible so could you hear what he Be said more visible for us hearing the speeches of people who are high minded a uh, present uh, speaker as an exception <laughs> i mean not so high minded but we'll give it a shot <laughs> uh, uh, this is actually one of the practices of of bhakti yoga also is to discuss and to deliberate the word deliberate Actually you can say deliberate or deliberate. 
try it. It's spelled the same way. In order to be deliberate in your life and in your actions, you really do have to deliberate first. The word deliberate has the word libra in it, which means the pan scales. You know those two scales? You put something on, a weight on one side, some cauliflower on the other, try to see how much it weighs. <laughs> you weigh things out. And one of, the, one of the meanings of deliberation is to consider the consequences for one's actions. So actually one of the practices of bhakti yoga uh, is to come together and deliberate about what are the best ways to use one's time and life, where to put one's attention especially. Take one more before I launch into my points about mind hacks. Yes. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for coming back. Great to see you. A year goes by pretty quickly. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Thanks for being here. I just, uh, I'm really impressed with, with what you're all doing. So uh, I'm from San Francisco. We live up uh, near the, near the, near San Francisco. It's a town called Burlingame. We, I just got down here this, this afternoon, to uh, participate in this program. And let me uh, tell you a, a few thoughts I have that um, are practical. They're things I've thought about very carefully and have uh, spoken about in various places around the Bay Area and other places around the world. About Let's first talk about the way the mind is, uh, can be closed. These are I call mind closures. Because the mind can, it can be open and take in the, the great wonders and lessons of the world or it can be closed and miss out on a lot of things. Do you agree with that proposition? One person only. So if you agree, just say, everyone say yes. Yes. Okay, good. Actually, in one of the oldest and most important wisdom literatures called the Bhagavad Gita, the teacher says that the mind can be the best friend or the worst enemy. And it really depends how you train your mind. And you only get one, so you might as well take good care of it. And that's really the beginning point in yoga, is to, to train the mind to be your friend. Now, what are some of the ways that the mind uh, can be closed? first is represented by this phrase, I already know that. Everyone say that. I already know that. Now when you say that, put your hand out like, you know, talk to the hand because the hand's not listening. Go said, I already, that. I already know that. Now turn to somebody next to you and say, you know, I already know that. <laughs> so that's the way to block, block all learning. I already know that. And whether I do it demonstratively, uh, like I already know that, sorry, talk to the hand, or if I'm just thinking that when somebody's saying something to me, or in any instance, uh, somebody's teaching, just, I already know that. If I'm thinking that, it, it closes the mind. I'm not actually a, able to take, some, take in what's being taught right then. Uh, what is the, the antidote to that? It's to, to realize something amazing and that is every situation in life is unique. In fact, if you'll, if you'll think about this for a moment, there's not one particle in the universe that's the same as another. There's not one person that's the same as another. Everyone's unique. And every situation is unique. It never happens exactly the same way again. And in a, in a universe that's unfolding, where every situation is unique, every word is unique, every person is unique, how is it that you already know everything? So one of the ways opening the mind is to be open to possibilities and keeping aware that I don't know anything. In fact, there's a, there's a term for that. It's called akinchana. So let's, why don't you try saying it as a Sanskrit word, Akinshana. Akinshana. K 
Kinshina means something, and when you put an A in front of Kinshina in Sanskrit, it reverses the meaning. It means not something or I don't have anything. So there's this idea of keeping the mind open all the time by being a Kinshina. It's like, I don't know anything, as opposed to the opposite, I already know that. So on this side you have, I already know that. In fact, I met somebody uh, who told me, I, I know everything. <laughs> I was some friends and I called him. I said, you've got to go over to this guy knows everything <laughs> you've got to meet him. <laughs> we found out it wasn't true. We asked him a few questions. but <laughs> He didn't live up to, to that billing. But I might think like that. I might develop an attitude that I already know everything. I've already heard that. I've been there before. And this dulls the mind and it closes it to the, the many wonders of the world. On the other side, if you develop this principle of akinshana, which means, I don't know anything. When you talk to somebody, when you're listening to something, take it as uh, oftentimes, sometimes in Buddhist teaching, they say beginner's mind, totally fresh. Look at it, it's like the first time you've ever heard it. And try quieting the little critic within you. When somebody's talking to you, it's possible that the, you're thinking, no, I'll say, I'm thinking. <coughs> they, as soon as they stop talking, then I'm going to tell them something much better than what they're saying right now. Because I already know that. But they're telling me I already know that, and I know a lot more. So this is one of the disciplines. It's, it's a mind hack. And you'll notice that your, your life will change tonight if you take this new attitude that I'm a kinchina. I actually don't know anything. And I'm open to hearing, again, whatever I thought I knew before. And just let it come in. Let me listen to it afresh. Because it's a unique situation. It's being spoken by a unique personality with, with, act with who has a unique perspective in the world. So that's, that's one of the first basic principles. That's a mind closure and the way to open it. Ready for number two? Yes. Say yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, number two. I need more. So say, I need more. I need more. That is a very basic principle, but it's amazingly effective. This idea, I, I, I need more, doesn't actually apply to us, ultimately. There is a, we, we do have a dual existence in this world, because we are spiritual beings who are presently inhabiting a material body. And let me elaborate on that a little more. This uh, body really is a biomechanical robot. Just look at it for a second. It's got levers and pulleys. Like, what's this kind of a lever system, right? There's a pump. Notice that your heart is pumping right now. You can have the valve replaced on your heart if it goes out. Do you know that? It's actually a simple operation right now. Mick Jagger just had it done. It, uh, he was back on his feet dancing within a couple of days. You know, a little replacement of the valve in his heart. Arnold Schwarzenegger had his replaced a little, uh, about 10 years ago. And... You know, these parts are replaceable, many of them, some of them aren't. But it, it's, a, it's a machine, and we're living within that machine. Now, we are categorically different from the machine, because we are the conscious being who's within this biomechanical machine. So having said that, one of the nature of the, the self that we are is that we're not so needy, actually. And of course, in meditation, it's described in the Bhagavad Gita, and I'll, I'll quote a little Sanskrit from this, uh, from the, the section that I would like you to uh, take with you, and that is, Prajahati Yadakaman Sarvan Partamanogatan Atman Yeva Atmana Tushta Stita Pragnas Tadochite. This comes in a section of this book called the Bhagavad Gita, where the student is actually asking the teacher, what is the nature of someone who's uh, fixed in higher consciousness? What is the symptom? How can you tell if you are there, if somebody else is in that? And the first thing that the teacher says is the person's able to distinguish between him or herself and the products that are produced by the mind. The mind, as described in this verse, is like a little factory. And it's creating uh, thousands of little products that are coming out on a conveyor belt, one after another, one after another, one after another. And the person who's fixed in consciousness notes that the mind's simply manufacturing 
uh, information or products from information that's taken in from the environment and it doesn't have to take the product. You don't have to take it. You're not obligated. So this means prajahatiyadakaman. The person looks at those things and thinks uh, the many ideas, desires, and things are created by the mind. I don't have to accept it. And the person, atman yivatmanatushta, say tushta. tushta. Say it one more time. Tushta. It's kind of a nice word. It means satisfaction. It almost sounds like that, tushta. Satisfaction. The person is able to go beyond the, the conveyor belt and all the products and appreciate, actually see him or herself and feel satisfaction in the self. So I'm going to give you one mantra that says, what you are is more important than what you have. Please repeat after me. What you are, what you are is more important, is more important than, what than what you have. Somebody tell me what that means to you in the context of what I'm saying right now. Be bold and, and try to like just belt it out there. And even if you're completely wrong, then uh, go down in flames. The okay, soul is more important than your temporary possessions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and you were going to say? Um, a person's character is more rich and wealthy than... A person's uh, character is a more rich commodity. Is that what you said? It's more rich in wealth than... More rich in wealth than... Than actual physical money. Than actual physical money. Yeah, they were getting somewhere on this. There's, there's a, a difference in value. And so, if a person actually sees, this verse is saying, if a person, if, if you are able to see yourself for what you actually are, because you're a conscious being, that means you're different from matter. Quality of matter is, it's always uh, undergoing uh, entropy, it's falling apart. But you're not. You're constant, steady. You never uh, undergo change or death. Those kinds of things are what I'm always afraid of. I don't like change, especially uh, the final change. I have to leave the body, my identity, everything else behind. It's a little scary, isn't it? Please say yes. Yes. Thank you. So, so now, if you're able to, this verse is saying, through introspection, you're actually able to experience yourself. And the implication here is that as a conscious being, you can be aware of yourself. yourself you can actually be conscious that you're conscious and be aware of your own consciousness. This is meditation. And when you have that, you'll feel tushta, satisfaction. And because of that, uh, you'll understand this point that what I am is more important than what I have. When I'm externally focused, I'm always thinking, my things are me. I identify with them. Like, don't I identify with my car? Do I? Did anybody drive here tonight? Who drove here tonight? Okay, now what if your car's right outside and we hear a smashing noise and it was right in the area where your car was? How do you feel? What is your name? Edwin. And Edwin, how would you feel if you're sitting here and you hear somebody hit your car? Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, someone answer for him. How would Edwin feel if someone hit his car? Uh, 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 give more details. Anxious, anxiety. Anxious means what? What would be happening physically? Yeah, uh, perspiration, heart movement. Of course, not Edwin. He looks like a per perfectly centered person. He wouldn't even care, maybe. He's a yogi. But an ordinary person. And then, let's say Edwin runs to the, the window and he looks out and it wasn't his car. Who else brought a car here? It was your car instead. How does Edwin feel? Remarkably <laughs> fantastic, all of a sudden. <laughs> so I'm giving this as a point. A car is a car, but one car is my car, another car is your car. So I identify with the external life situation that I'm in, and I say, this is mine. And when it changes, then I, I get uh, affected by that. But a person who's able to actually see the self within the self and understand this principle that what I am and actually experience the self is more important than what I have. That person, the mind is not disturbed when there's change in life. That's number two principle. Ready for number three? Yes. Yes. Okay, half the audience. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, number three, uh, closure of the mind, the way the mind gets closed, is uh, the world's against me. Now, tell me truthfully, did you ever feel like the world's against you? <laughs> it's very easy to do. Uh, because uh, so many things tend to go against my will. I have a plan, and uh, I would say practically in the history of the universe, not once did anybody's plan actually work out the way they thought that it was going to work out completely. And things go against us all the time. So the, this is a, a way my mind becomes closed because I start to see my environment and the things that are happening to me as... Uh, being uh, um, that I'm a victim of these things. And if you study victimology, you'll, s you'll see that people become very closed and bitter and un unable to take in the wonders of the world. So actually, the wisdom literatures talk about the fact that whatever happens to me in this world is actually meant to refine me. If someone, I just ask a, a, a theoretical question. If someone was able to p position him or herself in such a way as to take even adverse situations coming into to his or her life as a, a, a way to learn a lesson, a valuable lesson, do you think that person would live a richer life? Yes. Who said yes? Yes? Would you explain why you think that? What is your name? Paola. Paola, okay. Oh, so Paul is saying she feels that there are situations in which nature is providing uh, lessons for her to grow. Okay. Who else said yes? <laughs> Few, fewer people than the first time I asked. So this is the essence. In fact, any self-respecting help self-help guru anywhere in the universe will tell you this is the basis of all self-help and that is it's not what happens to you that matters what you do about what happens to you which means it it's the way you see what happens to you so one of the ways to to change your life and to open the mind and get the most out of what's happening to the world is to take the lesson from everything that happens to you whether it's good or bad Typically, I try to ward off bad things. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't wake up this morning praying for some disaster, right? Please tell me no. I mean, people, everywhere I go, I see people, like in America, there's a horseshoe. Apparently, if you put a horseshoe up, it brings good luck. And uh, in India, people put Lakshmi Devi, a little emblem on their door. Um, Everyone has some little thing. Please let good luck come in. Bad luck, you stay way out there. <laughs> but that, that doesn't necessarily happen, does it? I mean, as much as I try to avoid bad situations, they come anyway. Please say yes. yes. Yeah, they come with their own accord. So a wise person, a person who's able to actually utilize the mind to its highest potential is one who's able to position him or herself in such a way as to take the lesson out of that adverse situation. And if, if you're able to live in that way, what, according to the, one of the uh, most revered of all the yoga texts in the world called Srimad Bhagavatam, that this is the quintessential attitude that brings you up to the highest levels of consciousness living in your life. It's changing from being a victim to when something happens, like, oh, the world's against me. I'm being tortured for no reason. To actually, like, there's a lesson in this, and it's not so easy to do. But it, if one practices this, if you try it, you'll see that actually it turns reality, uh, what you thought was reality, uh, right side up, and you're able to see things actually as they are. That the, the universe is benevolent. And whatever is happening to me is actually for my betterment. Can I tell you a story? Yes. You don't hate stories? No. Okay. This actually happened. I was, I was gardening in my backyard. I love gardening. I spend a lot of time in the garden. And one fine summer day, I was out in the backyard <coughs> gardening, and I saw a little bird fly into our house. 
And birds, wild birds, really don't belong in houses. <laughs> it's not their thing. I went in to rescue the poor little bird. He was in the kitchen. And uh, at that time, we had these uh, double-paned windows. It's an old house, 1927 house, and a wooden window. So I started uh, opening the windows, and they made sort of a racket when I opened them. And little bird saw me opening the windows and heard the noise and, and said, oh, you're trying to kill me, and went into the next room, <laughs> where I then proceeded to open all the windows and say, little bird, don't get me wrong, I, lo you're, you know, I love you. you get, I want you to go free and do your bird thing outside. And then I went to the next room, next room, and every room he flew away from me thinking I was after him. Finally, all the way around, back we went to the kitchen from every room in the house. And then little bird sitting looking at me. And the look in his eye told me a lot. It said, you tried to kill me. <laughs> you weren't successful. And now I see a way out, because he, he, he actually saw the opening in the window. And just before he flew out, he, he gave me that glance. <laughs> and then he flew out the window. And I sat down sort of a little bit of an emotional state. Because I, I, I sort of was an existential uh, experience I had. And I, I actually um, felt empathy for the bird. And I started thinking, I'm just like that bird. There's windows opening for me. But as the change comes in my life, there's sort of a noise that happens. There may be some big movement that's going on. And I take it, oh, this is meant for my ultimate doom but actually someone's trying to help me this is actually the perspective of the yoga teachings the, the universe actually is benevolent one of my colleagues a great teacher always says that, that the universe is actually cosmic sensitivity training it's meant to uh, refine me more and more and actually uh, all these reversals are opportunities now because this is a short class, I'll take a few uh, reflections. I have more points, but these are the three main points that I guarantee if you take them with you, you'll, you know, take, you can, you can apply them immediately. And you'll notice if you practice them, you'll see that your mind begins to open, your life becomes more, uh, becomes richer, and you'll, you'll start to feel like I can actually reach my full potential by these three mind hacks. First of all, please tell me what the first one was. There's a closure and an opening. So the closure was? I, know I, know. I already know that. I already know that. And the opening is? I don't know, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I, I'm a, a kinchina. I have nothing. I don't know anything. I'm open. I'm, I'm humble and open. Number two? That one didn't sink in, did it? <laughs> Can anybody remember what it was, including me? Huh? Yeah, what I am is more important than what I have. And we talked about the fact that actually what I am is, is a conscious entity who's within this body. And it's, as a conscious entity, actually, we're categorically different from matter that's always changing. If you can if you can even see it for one second and feel satisfaction, you'll notice that it's more valuable than anything else in the world. In fact, those pan scales I mentioned in deliberation, the Libra scales, if you put everything in, where are we right now? What city are we in? We're in Culver City. If you take everything in Culver City, and there's a lot of stuff here, right? Sony. Sony, okay, put Sony on one side of the scale. What else? What else? All the buildings on one side of the scale. The <laughs> well, that's a, like in a different category kind of. But all the cars, all the money. There's a lot of money here. You pile it all over the scale. If you put yourself, your actual spiritual self, on the other side of the scale, you're more weighty. You're more important. By unlimited quantities. There's no comparison even. That's how important you are as your original identity. So what you are is more important than what you have. You don't actually need more 
if you see yourself. You can feel satisfaction in yourself. And then the third one was? Yeah, the closure is I'm a victim and that uh, the world's out to get me. And the, the, the antidote is? Take a lesson from everything that happens. Yes. If this is real wisdom. If you're actually able to extract the lesson from everything that happens to, to you, including the reversals of fortune, then you become a very wise and uh, progressive, uh, realized person. Yeah. Now, I'll take a few reflections. Any of the points that you heard that stuck in your mind? Just for like three, three four minutes. Uh, and th this part's easy because all you have to do is remember one little thing that, uh, that you heard from the monologue and then repeat it back. It's stuck in your mind. Yes, it, all the way in the back. We resist pain. We resist pain. Yeah. We want comfort, we want happiness, we want everything to come in. And, and as much as we resist pain, and, and does it visit us sometimes? Yes. Every once in a while, eh? <laughs> okay, and you had one in the, all the way in the very back, yeah. What, uh, elaborate what I mean by the universe is benevolent? Well, from the perspective of the wisdom literatures, we're, we're here for sensitivity training and to become more refined entities. For instance, the law of karma says, if I do something to somebody else, it comes back to me, and I get to see how it feels. So if I get to see how things feel when I do them to other people, I may become more empathetic, as an example. Empathy is a very refined a sentiment. Do you like to be around people who are empathetic? Yes. It doesn't really bug you at all? that they're se sensitive to how you're feeling and they can uh, identify with it. That's a, that's a very elevated uh, and also non-tangible. You know, you can't buy empathy in a store. Just go to Rite Aid and tell them you want to buy a little empathy. It's developed, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a highly refined substance that distinguishes a, a very advanced person from somebody who's uh, struggling in the, in the world. So, yes, uh, being able to see how we're, we're being refined by various things that happen to us and fine-tuning our own life and the way we treat others uh, because of the things that happen to us is a way to, to make progress in life. That's what I meant by that. A couple more reflections. Anything you heard? Yes? Yes, uh, first, it's gratitude. Thank you for sharing our new wisdom. Uh, a reflection that I had was from when you shared that what I am is more important than what I have and in my personal experience here I used to have I used to think that what I had was more important than what I was and at a point of my early journey I used to have a lot of what society would would share that you were supposed to have and I used to have a relationship a car a, a paying job I used to go to school and throughout my journey I don't have any of that anymore, but what I feel is a lot more liberated, what I feel is a lot more peace, and I've understood that in that realization that what I'm searching for is not outside, but is within, and the more I come back to that realization that everything that I am really looking for is already here, it allows me to understand more where to go next, so I wanted to thank You're a really good speaker. <laughs> Seriously, that was, that was well put, thank you very much. I just uh, I want to make a, 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 put a caveat to that w point that I made. It doesn't mean that you can't. It has to happen in every talk, at least once. <laughs> but there's tape here, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> knowing and appreciating yourself and feeling that sa inner satisfaction and having things in the world aren't mutually are mutually exclusive. Means you don't have to abandon everything and walk away from everything uh, because there are three paths mentioned in the, in the wisdom literatures. One path is the path of acquisition. That means I, I'm actually thinking that 
the more things I get, or the more I'm able to position myself in the world, the happier I'll become. Now, if anybody's done a study of this, you'll notice that it doesn't really work. Right? You're agreeing? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, then there's the path of renunciation. You might come to the point of saying that I've acquired so many things, they've actually caused me frustration, therefore I renounce everything in the world. This doesn't work, work either. Just as much, and it doesn't even make sense because I don't, I don't actually ultimately own anything in this world. Everything I have is on loan. Like your body, for instance. Did you get a lease? Anybody? <laughs> Must be out in the car, right? Glove box? You didn't sign a lease? You don't know how long you're going to stay in this body. I don't know. If somebody asked me today, I just got here to Los Angeles, they said, how long are you going to be here? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. So, if I walk in the Bank of America and I say, I renounce this bank and all the money in it, everyone will say, okay, go ahead, you're, go out. You know, because it's not mine. The body's not mine. All the wealth I think I have, it's, I'm, it's only on loan. So the idea of renouncing everything, this is not a stable situation. Neither is the idea of acquiring everything and trying to position myself in such a way that I'll be happy in the world. There's a third path. That path is called the path of dedication or service, selfless service. It means if you use what you have to serve, then you actually feel satisfaction. It's called supersedity. Your, your, your heart feels happy. So in that case, you could be a king and you could use all your wealth to do good for as many people as possible. But you can still be in the consciousness of what I, ha what I am is more important than what I have and still have things. But you can use them for a higher purpose of service, selfless service. Okay, that was like th three minutes and now we have a, I think we have a few minutes left, right? Till 8.15, is that correct? So now, uh, if I dare to ask, see if anybody has a question. Question mark is the most powerful punctuation mark in any language because it makes the speaker answer what you have, what you're asking. Yes? In the third one, 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 the Sometimes bad things that happen, it bothers us. Yes. But when first we accept it, then uh, take lesson, we can handle it. Yeah, that's the question. Should we accept what? If a reversal yes. comes to us, do we Should first we accept, accept it? it? Well, I'll, I'll refer back to, to the section of the wisdom literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, that I was speaking about. And it says, if for authenticity, in Sanskrit, tatenukam pam susumikshamanu bunjane ivatmakritam vibhakam. And so this, this Sanskrit verse says that a person who has a really, really high perspective, in other words, sees that I'm on a continuum. This is not my only life. I've had other lives that I've passed through. And there are many things uh, that I've done and seen and, and uh, ways in which I've acted. And now, whatever is coming to me in this life, good or bad, is a result of what I've done in the past. That's what the, the verse says. So in a way, uh, it is an acceptance that this is not coming f from somebody else. I'm, I'm, I'm causing what's happening to me, or I've caused it. Now, there's good news in that, because if I accept that, it means that I can change it also. If I don't accept that, I just accept I'm a pure victim, or I, I think that everything's happening to me is, is uh, senseless, and it's just some, some random torture, then really, how am I going to be able to change it? But if I accept it, and then look at it, as a, and then take the lesson from it, this is perfect uh, alignment with the principle that I mentioned. If you stay in that mindset, you'll notice that your life is... Uh, richer, more progressive. Time for one more question. Yes? How to produce what? 
Produce, how to produce good thoughts. The best way to produce good thoughts is through mantra. So you were doing mantra when I walked in. So man means mind and tra means to deliver or to, to enrich. So uh, the best way to uh, come out with good thoughts is to put good sound vibration in here. The best of it is mantra. It's a science. You can look into the science of mantra because every, every element in this universe has a point at which it, it achieves uh, its maximum acoustic resonance. In other words, sound vibration is pervasive in this world. And we, as conscious living beings, also there's a vibration at which we resonate and we reach our highest potential. And that comes from the mantra. Now, let's just say you've had a hard day, you drag yourself home because you know so many weird things have happened to you that day and you're tired, hungry, grouchy, uh, not grateful, upset, what else? Frustrated. Frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> so now you get home. Are you picturing this? Yes. Okay, good. Then you get home and then, then you turn on the TV and you watch, let's say, uh, CNN for 12 hours. Feel any better? <laughs> or you go home and you find or make or revisit a sacred place that you made in your home. Little corner somewhere. It's clean, nice. You've designated as very intentionally as the place where you're going to actually raise your consciousness. And you sit down just for a few minutes and you practice your mantra. You say the mantra, you listen to the mantra, the sound vibration is certified to be of a higher nature and it goes in and it resonates with your higher self. Feel any better? Yes. You definitely will. So there's a science to this. In, in the ancient Upanishads, some of the oldest books in the world, it says, When result is obtained by listening to material sound and a completely different result comes from hearing spiritual sound. And so uh, I just did a seminar up in, Cal in uh, Northern California, it's called You Are Here, but here is spelled H-E-A-R. Did you get it? Yes. You are here. <laughs> because you are what you hear. And if, if you, as I started this whole talk, put yourself in front of transcendental sound, then naturally you'll develop what you were saying was good thoughts. Or you'll, you'll be able to more, you know, that's, that's sort of a general term, but your perspective will become sharper, which is very important for, for being happy in life. And also you'll get two qualities from the mantra that you won't get anywhere else. One of them is called vairagya, which means a detachment. Like, this is one of the reasons people take intoxication. Take intoxication, then they feel detached from all their problems for a little while. But if you want to have it in the real, genuine sense, and you generate it, you know, f from a, a, a platform that, that will last, um, the mantra is for you. And the other one is called jnana, or knowledge, and it gives you a, a clear idea that you're different from your body. And you get that from mantra, and you don't get it from CNN so much. So thank you very much for, for your kind attention. It's, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to be here at The Mantra House.